Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State of the Museum for 2022 here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. I'm Anne Marie Miller, Vice President of Development here at the museum. And you are about to hear some wonderful stories from our past year. Everything from dinosaurs to thousands of school children, from World War II railroaders to great classic Hollywood films, and of course, how we are always shooting for the stars. And everything we do here throughout the year, everything that you're gonna hear that's coming up, would not be possible without you. Our members, our Visionary Society members, and all of our great partners here in the community. So on behalf of our board of directors, our staff, and our entire community, thank you. And now I am pleased to introduce our first speaker. He's the chairman of both our Visionary Society and our incredible board of directors, and the president of Prairie Home Alliance, Mr. Steve Jackson. These are the kind of instructions I get. John says, you do your rah-rah and then give the mic to Todd. So, <laughs> but I, I know many of you, I am not a rah-rah guy. So let's pretend that I am, I'll say something, clap, yell, cheer, do something, all right? So we'll just do it in the best spirit of that. It, it actually is a wonderful honor for me to stand in front of you today and report on the state of our beloved museum. <clears throat> I can't imagine, actually, that this museum is in the place that it is today. The events over the last five years under John's leadership have been nothing short of phenomenal. When you put the staff into play in those five years of time, their work, their attitude, their effort, their knowledge is nothing short of superb. It's amazing to me that this sits right here in our community and we are so blessed for that to be the case. I'd like you to consider these facts. General public attendance is up. GST, Giant Screen Theater, attendance is up. Planetarium attendance is up. Students of all age groups, that attendance is up as well. And last year it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 students. So imagine the Civic Center, every seat filled with a student of some age has made their way through this museum in the last year. That has remarkable, remarkable positive results in the years to come. And it's one of the very best things that is done here. Family memberships are up. Exhibit hall space is up. Exhibits are up and so are blockbusters as well. Philanthropy is up. Membership in the Visionary Society is nearly 400 strong. John reminds us often as a group that when he came, he liked to say he was the 100th member of that group. It was, and I think that's actually true. That was five years ago. The resulting income was about $120,000. We just concluded this fiscal year, or will in a week, and we are nearly 400 members strong, and the revenue is going to finish at better than $625,000. Um, Lots of great work, lots of <laughs> that income, you know, is not earmarked for anything specific. And that makes it wonderful income to do with it what needs to be done here. And we are blessed with, um, with that group. I doubt if there's anybody in this room that is not a visionary society member. We don't need to do a show of hands and I'll thank you in a bit, but I can't tell you how important that particular endeavor is to this museum. <clears throat> our partnerships are up and our strategic partnerships are up. Our digital footprint is so far up, up that it's literally off the charts. What's been accomplished here that was forced upon us and we should have been thinking about doing it anyway, but forced upon us through by way of the pandemic, the results have been amazing. And, and, and truthfully, and I've got enough exposure to museum around the country, I think we led the way during that. I mean, it, what these guys put out for contact, content, the interaction between the museum and people that are staying at home, I've, I've learned an awful lot, and I try to read everything that comes out of the museum, but our digital footprint is amazing, and it's growing. Our reputation in the community is up, and it's increasing. 
a reputation in the world of museums is up and it is growing. Education is up and finally inspiration and self-confidence are up as well. So the theme there, pretty easy to see. Everything is up, growing, increasing, moving in the right direction. In an effort to kind of uh, do fair and balanced reporting, I combed the records looking for something that is down. Truth is I found one, it's deficits. The deficits, deficits here are down. And, and you, you know, you don't have to go be back very far um, in our history to see the aggressive, challenging nature of trying to get us to the point where we are today. The deficits, deficits being eliminated is a big thing. We're gonna share a little bit of black, we believe, as we finish this out um, in the next week or so. We're planning a balanced budget for next year and I have nothing but great high hopes. I hope you agree with that this, uh, that this five year trend is much better than saying we're off to a good start, but I want you to know that all of us understand we have a lot more work to do. We're do gonna do a lot more building here in this venue and I know that we are just at the point where the best is yet to come. I wanna thank you because all of those things that I mentioned up, the results that we have aren't possible without you. Your interest, your time, your talent, your treasure, you've done all of that for the museum. We're fortunate to have a great steward in John and a talented staff so that those efforts bear fruit and it's a wonderful thing, wonderful thing for our community. I couldn't be happier to be associated with this museum. I talk to people about it almost every day. And I'm still amazed at the people in and around our community who haven't been in this building yet, but that also is up and it's growing. So I wanna thank each of you. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Um, Todd Baker's gonna take over. I promised I'd pass it off to him. And I'm gonna just stand off to the side because I look like a 65 year old toddler climbing in and out of those stools. It's like <laughs> the fat kids getting in there for the high chair and that's just not me. So I'll be over here to the side, thank you. Thank you, Steve. How about a hand for Steve? <laughs> Steve, on, uh, on behalf of the board, it's our honor to serve with you and we really appreciate your leadership. It's, it's outstanding and thank you for that. Um, I think Steve touched on an issue with respect to staff. If there's a staff member here, could you stand up so we could recognize you? I know there's quite a few. It's hard to see from here, but please stand up so people can recognize you. I mean, these are the people that actually make it happen here for us. And, and on, as on behalf of the board, we thank you for that work. I have the honor to uh, and the privilege to serve uh, with some great people on the board here at the museum, and, and four of them have been selected, voluntold, as we like to say around here, or didn't answer the email from John, so they heard today what they were gonna do, and they're here to, uh, to uh, give you folks a, a real look at the state of the museum, maybe a little more in depth than uh, Steve went. Let me introduce them, please. Karen Jensen, CEO of Farnsworth Group, serves as our uh, Chair of Finance Committee, so she'll be talking a bit about that. Lisa Gates with RLI will be uh, talking a bit about our strategic plan. If you don't know Lisa very well, you have to meet Lisa's daughter. She's the number one seven-year-old docent at the museum. She's the best we've got, and she's outstanding. If you haven't had a tour by Alex Gates, get one. I can tell you it's outstanding. Brian Ray, president of PNC, will be talking about um, Corporate Visionary Society and the Every Student Initiative. And then Dr. Sarah Zalek, Neurology, OSF. Dr. Zalek and I met each other in my previous life, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say about our PIA model. So with that, I will just turn this over to Karen. Karen, you wanna jump in and talk to us about the financial state of the museum, please. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here and to share the good news, talk a little bit about our fiscal year, which is gonna be ending here at the end of June, and then talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, so uh, briefly, our revenue for uh, 2022 is expected to be about $4.5 million. And the good news is that we uh, expect, uh, with these projections, to hit the budget target for both sponsorships and for core and visionary society memberships and we expect to exceed the budget for unrestricted and cultural match funds for 2022. Very exciting to share with you that our expenses were uh, controlled 
um, very diligently. Salary is our largest expense, and we expect to end this fiscal year with a positive approximately $12,000 bottom line. I'm excited that we're going to be entering the year from a foundation standpoint of uh, about $11.7 million balance. Of course, with the roller coaster ride, that's down a little bit uh, with recent performance, but still very strong. Our budget for next year will be increased by about a half a million dollars to $5 million in revenue. Keep in mind about 80% of that is philanthropy money and 20% is earned revenue. The staff presented this, and I, I wanted to share with you ambitious but achievable goals for fundraising and memberships. There'll be an increase in admission fees budgeted of about 30%, very strong there, an increase in Visionary Society memberships, about 20%. Contributions and fundraising should be back in the swing of things with the return of our July 4th Backyard Barbecue, the holiday luncheon, and the special opportunity to celebrate the museum's 10-year anniversary. There is also no grants uh, or contra uh, government contributions uh, that we have experienced the last couple of years. So in last year, we had about 500,000, and this budget uh, does not reflect any continued contributions in that amount. Our expenses, uh, uh, the largest expense that we have, of course, is personnel. That's about 50% of our budget. We do have a few couple new positions that are budgeted to assist us and will help drive up those uh, contributions and earn revenue goals. And also the museum experience with a couple part-time uh, membership coordinators uh, and greeters and docents. So taking those revenues uh, and subtracting our expenses and the additional things that we want to do, we are expecting a break-even budget for next year. I want to thank you for uh, the generosity uh, of the individuals and the hard work that, is, that continues to be done to advance the museum. It's very exciting times. Uh, the Finance Committee is very strong and, and uh, we have excellent staff. And so being good shepherds of the contributions and the earned revenue and, and turning those into effective uh, results for the museum. We just finished a meeting and uh, I thought I wanted to share with you that uh, it was quoted that we're able to all work together to teach others the joy of the museum. So with that, thank you. Karen, thank you very much. <clears throat> and, and thank you so much for your uh, leadership on that finance committee. I just want to comment one thing. I, I don't know if you all heard that. That was what kind of budget? A balanced budget. So. Uh, for those that have been around the museum for a while, it's not always been balanced. So another hand for that. So thank you for your committee. Thank you. Lisa Gates, strategic plan. All right. We're very excited. We just completed an update to the museum strategic plan. And, you know, the goal of our plan is really to provide new, unique experiences for the families in our community, for the students of our community, and for the community that will inspire, that will lend itself and foster lifelong learning, as well as uh, really just support, lift up our community, and create better quality of place and life for all of us um, in the community. So that's the overriding goal of what we're looking to, that's what the we come to our meetings every time to hope to accomplish, the, the staff comes to work every day to accomplish, and I think we are, we are absolutely doing that. So to support that on an ongoing basis and the incredibly positive momentum that has been created thus far, there are really three core new focus areas that we have integrated into this new strategic plan moving forward to support those different uh, groups that I mentioned. The first area is around affinity groups. And the, the thought behind this is really continuing to provide engaging exhibitions, blockbuster content, um, relevant and unique experiences that everyone in our community can interact with and, and uh, be very uh, excited about and continue to, to be excited to come to the museum to see. 
part of that is really continuing to provide engaging, relevant content to the, the groups, the constituents in our community, as well as the affinity groups that come to the museum for a very unique and specific need or interest that they're looking to fulfill. Um, so that is one key area. The, I know the team is hard at work continuing to provide that content, looking at what the next exhibits are gonna be, and leveling up, elevating the experience as much as we possibly can. The second key area of the plan is focused on something we're calling personalized interactive achievement. And the thought behind this is really to increase engagement with the museum, with museum content, by integrating things like loyalty programs, incentives, and even gamification, providing new and different ways to marry the tactile in-person experience of coming to the museum with a little bit of a rewarding, fun um, element to increase engagement with the content we're providing, the programs we're providing, both while someone is visiting the museum and well after they have left, with the hopes that they will then increase their visits or interest in coming back to the museum time after time or as new programs and exhibits are brought into the museum. So we're super excited about this. We've already uh, integrated some, some elements of this into the programming that's currently at the museum, but hope to take this to the next level. The third area that is a core tenant of this new strategic plan is really also around digital content and virtual engagement. Uh, you know, Steve had mentioned a little bit already that, that the museum staff has done an absolutely incredible job extending the museum and the content and the programs we provide well beyond the walls of this museum and well beyond our zip code and area code. We have fans and are increasing in prominence and reach in all areas of the country. We have museum fans that are, that are engaging with our digital content, and we feel that there's a lot more that can be done here to, to you know, grow our fan base, both within the, the community here, as well as outside of the Peoria area to help raise the prominence of our community as a whole and lift, lift us up in its entirety. Um, you know, the thing that I think is really exciting about this one is it, the goal and the intent here is also to look at potentially creating more immersive experiences with the exhibitions, the programming that we provide here at the museum. I think this pre, you know, presents a wide range of opportunity from just allowing a child, for example, to not only learn about an artist, but through potentially providing a virtual reality experience, also allowing them to step into a painting and explore that artwork with the, with the artist who created it. So a lot of really interesting, unique things we can do in the digital content realm, as well as virtual programming that we can marry with a trip to the museum that will just provide more immersive, more um, engaging experiences overall for visitors of all ages. So we are extraordinarily excited about these three areas, these new focus areas, and there are a lot of <coughs> initiatives and additional uh, tactics that, are, that go along and we'll be supporting and we will be moving forward and the staff will be working on to support these three core tenants. But that I would say in a, in a nutshell, there's a lot to the strategic plan, but in a nutshell, those are the, the things we are looking to do to elevate, to continue to provide programming that we are all proud of and that makes us wanna come back and engage with the Peoria Run Riverfront Museum time and time again throughout the year. So I think, that's, I think that's it, but we're very excited, a lot, uh, a lot of really good things in the works, and um, stay tuned, more to come. Lisa, thank you very much. You bet. Lisa says, I think that's it. I can't wait to step into the painting. <laughs> Virtual reality, a lot's coming. Look forward to seeing it all, so thank you. Brian Ray, Every Student Initiative. Well, note to self, I don't want to follow Lisa ever again. <laughs> Because <laughs> that was, I mean, that was it. Like, you guys already have it, right? Uh, that was a mic drop moment, thank you. Uh, way to sum that up. So uh, there's a couple things that I want to talk about, and there are, um, there are themes that I hope that you've heard 
And um, one of those, which Steve mentioned, and I'm going to mention it again, um, is that I feel so fortunate to be involved with the group of professionals that uh, I get to be with. I get to, not I have to, I get to be with on this board uh, every month. It, it really is, it's been an incredibly fun journey. And if you aren't feeling the passion already from the folks who have been here, um, then I, I think that you might need a little bit of coffee uh, because the, the engagement level that I've seen since I've been part of this museum maybe four and a half, four years ago, um, the engagement level has been unbelievable. And what we're also excited about is the engagement that we are hoping to continue to foster with the community. So if you haven't heard enough, community, family, students, and engagement, that's what we're about. Uh, we are so excited to be able to take the programming that we've been working on for the last several years and take it to that next level. And that's, that's the strategic plan that Lisa was talking about. There's, um, there's a couple things, actually, that I was tasked to talk to you about, um, one of which is uh, referred to as the Corporate Visionary Society. So um, Steve gave some statistics to you about the growth of the Visionary Society, which are our members at the $1,000 and above level that have grown from 100 to 400 in the last five years, which is absolutely remarkable, especially when you think about what's gone on in the last five years, two of which in particular. Um, and I think it's because we are, we as a board, we as a staff have successfully found that level of engagement and we're able to pull people in. And I think that folks want to be involved, right? And that's something that's very exciting for us. One of the things that brings about that excitement is a strategy that we started about four years ago, which was the blockbuster strategy. Uh, the blockbuster strategy is what has brought things like T-Rex and Art of the Brick, um, Titanic, those were all kind of blockbusters. And as you probably know, they're really expensive to get those here. We want so badly to provide that for our community, to give access to everybody in the community to those types of exhibits, uh, but it costs a lot. As a, as a transplant five years ago, so lucky, I had no idea how lucky I was gonna be. As a transplant, and I've lived in a couple communities throughout the country, um, this is, this is the most generous and philanthropic community I've ever been part of, ever, hands down. Uh, way out fight, way outside our weight class on that. And, you know, one of the things that we as a board, and I hope that you heard what, what Karen said, I had the pleasure of serving as the treasurer for three years before Karen took over. Um, she's doing much better, by the way. You're very fortunate. Uh, but we feel, a, we feel a very serious fiscal responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to you, to our community. And one of the things that we want to make sure of is even when we want to bring in these blockbuster um, exhibits, we need to make sure that we're going to be able to fund it so that we don't have those deficits creeping back in, right? Um, and it, there's always risk, right? There is no reward without risk. We know that. Everything in life. Uh, but one of the things we decided to do uh, was we created something called the Corporate Visionary Society. And very fortunate that we have uh, our membership in that um, is, is not in the hundreds. You'll ex understand that in a minute. Um, but it is almost in the tens, which is a really great place to start. Um, and what we have asked in the Corporate Visionary Society is we've asked for some of our companies in town to make three-year commitments. And they start at $10,000. And so far, we have four companies who have stepped up at $10,000 a year committed for three years, two companies at $15,000 a year for three years, and two for $25,000 a year for three years. And what that allows us to do is to plan. Because these exhibits like Da Vinci, like Art of the Brick, like T-Rex, like, I won't let it slip, the next one that we have coming, which we're very excited about, I almost let that one out. <laughs> 
we need to know that we can do that to bring this engagement with the community and also to be fiduciary stewards for this museum. So you're probably gonna hear more about that. Um, if you're a business owner, look out. You might wanna exit quickly, because I will find you. And it is another part of our strategy to go with the strategic plan to provide all of this engagement to the family, students, and community. So that's just, that's part of what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the other thing that I was asked to talk to you about was on the Every Student Initiative. Um, if you've been around here for the last couple of years, you've heard this quite a bit, and I know Steve talked about it. Um, we had, we have now 36 schools in six school districts and 12,000 children who we are able to affect by a visit to the museum each year and that continues to grow. One of the greatest things about this program is that almost every school is uniquely sponsored by somebody through philanthropy. And it just, it continues to astound me, people who step up to provide that level of engagement for the kids. One of the things that you may not know about uh, and it was a concept that we've talked about um, in the board for a couple years, and I know this will sit well with you, Mayor Lee, is that we are so lucky to be able to bring in all of these children and to see their smiling faces and to see them learn and to see them be inspired and to inspire us while they're doing it. But what about the families, right? There's a lot of families that can't afford $15 a head to come in here, right? And so one of the things that we did a couple years ago was we put together a little fund and we sponsored that. We said, you know, let's give these kids a little coupon to take home and let those families come in. And we've had over 900 come in thus far. And this is something we are now making permanent. So when the students come in on their visits, they actually get to take home a little pass to their families. And whether it is whoever their caretakers might be, it might be a mother or a father or a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a brother or sister, they get to bring them to the museum and they can be the docent for their family to increase that level of engagement because they are our next leaders. They're the people that we really want to affect. Those are the people who we need to affect. And that lifelong education and learning is so exciting for us. So it's something that as you hear about our budget continuing to go up and you wonder, because you don't get to see the finance report like I do every, every month, where is some of that? That's what we're doing. We are trying to spend your money and our money collectively to bring this entire community together. And we think that we've got a great lead in with these kids on ESI, and we're really excited to see how this continues to grow uh, with our parents and caretakers as they get to come in and experience the museum as well. So if you didn't know about it, hopefully that's a fun tidbit you get to take home with you. And we are super proud of that as a board. Thank you. Brian, thanks very much. If you haven't had the opportunity to be here on a school day, when the place is full of kids and chattering and running around and talking, it's a, it, it's, it is a real prize. I would suggest you do it. it it's, it'll really kind of reinvigorate you as to what, what, where our youth is today. So uh, Dr. Sarah Zalek, please. The museum, I see the museum, and we talk about this a lot, as sort of inspiring people who come in here to learn, know, be curious, and achieve. And you see a little kid come in here and they learn something or they're inspired to do something that will change what they do. That this might be the thing, you know, Alex might be a paleontologist because she can give you the entire T-Rex tour herself, right? She came 10 times. And there are kids who will come here and be inspired to do something or parts of the community that will be, the whole community is better because of a good museum. And this museum ecosystem, the museum community ecosystem, depends on a bunch of things. All the stuff you guys have talked about are the mechanics of that. So that it requires a staff. And the staff, for those of you who don't know the staff here, they're, again, fighting way outside their weight 
class, is that what you said? Yes, the staff here for this museum are so talented and clever and we have, you know, we, the, the board leads under the direction of, of under the, the chairmanship of Steve Jackson, the best person in the world. And we really um, hope to inspire and lead appropriately, but we have this, the staff who actually do the work. They think and create and do and, and achieve and execute on all these ideas. So the staff is key, the board is important, but in the ecosystem, we need members, Visionary Society and other members, and we need vi corporate Visionary Society members. We need sponsors who actually allow us to plan and do these things, as you said. Those pieces are really important, and the museum isn't, it's not just important to the museum, but the museum is important to the people who are in those groups, right? So if you're a sponsoring company, your community is better because of the museum. It's a very sort of, uh, interactive uh, um, symbiotic relationship, right? We also need museum goers. So we have staff, we have a board, we have members, we have sponsors, visionary society or corporate visionary society members, and museum goers, people who actually come to see the exhibits and the movies and the stuff and eat the popcorn. And the museum goers, some, of, some people are museum people. We talk about who was a museum kid, who wasn't a museum kid. And you might have the habit of going to a museum and you might feel comfortable going into a museum and know how to sort of feel your way around and find interesting things and stop and read a, a placard at a painting. Or you might be very uncomfortable doing that. There aren't a lot of people in a community who are true museum enthusiasts and habitual museum goers. And I think what we're doing here, all the things that you've said creates a space for people who are not museum kids, and I include adults, to become museum kids in a way that it brings them joy to interact with the museum and all these niche things that are available, whether it's the planetarium under Renee Kerrigan or the, the giant screen theater and all the things that we have in the exhibits. Somebody's, there's something for everyone here. A lot of people don't know that. So we wanna make it really interactive and joyful. And the staff is doing that. And the, the thing that I'm gonna wrap up with is this PIA initiative with the staff cleverly named as, I think it's a personal individual achievement. Is that right? So, so you get, it's gamification, right? Like Lisa was saying, and you, people will come in who might not even be museum kids and get points for doing this and get a prize for doing that. And we love, we humans love a little bit of achievement. And so starting to engage in a way that, that reduces barriers and increases the engagement for the museum is gonna be really, I think a great uh, way the, the PIA initiative will bring in museum goers who will become members, who will become sponsors, who will become visionary society members, who might become board members, who might become staff. And so that engagement that the staff, the unbelievably good staff uh, and our enthusiastic board are trying to create with your support, I think is creating an ecosystem for this community that's gonna keep making it better. Thank you, Dr. Zalek. <clears throat> So um, on behalf of the Board of Directors, we are excited about our future. Uh, we're very proud, if you haven't figured that out, of where we are today and where we're going in the future. And so thank you for your time this evening. I think I can say that the state of the museum is strong, and I'm proud to say that. Uh, with that, I will introduce John Morris, our CEO, the CEO of the only multidisciplinary museum for those that haven't talked to John before. <laughs> Thank you to the board members for your service. We propose doubling their pay every year. They serve voluntarily in the board, I think collectively, has given, uh, since my arrival five years ago, uh, well over a million dollars them, themselves or their business. It's an amazing group of people. So let's hear it for the board and other board members who are here. Uh, before I do anything else, I want to introduce an extraordinary woman who epitomizes everything about the inspirational qualities of this museum. She celebrated this past year her 100th birthday here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum with all of her friends and family. Harriet Swager is here for the State of the Museum Address. Harriet, God bless you. Thank you for uh, being a great giver visionary society council member and she reads all those emails we send out. So um, we, are, we are always pleased to be in the people's house 
every day. This is a privately funded museum living in a public house. And today, the chairman of the county board and members of the county board and the county administrators with us, Chairman Rand, thank you very much for letting us live in the People's House here at the museum. Um, also joined today by the mayor of the greatest city in the world, Peoria, Illinois, Mayor Rita Ali. Thank you for being here. Also, I would like to mention the, the Peoria Riverfront Museum has a board that governs everything we do, and they have a board that manages a significant amount of money that is growing through gifts and good investments. And that is a separate board appointed by the board of directors of the Peoria Riverfront Museum called the Peoria Riverfront Museum Foundation Board. And members of the foundation, including the chair, Marcy Schof and Pat Cudaletta, new to the foundation board and other foundation board members, if you would just stand up so we can recognize the foundation board and what you do. And Marcy, I think you were here and up there. We've got Marcy and Doug Stewart. Thank you very much. And Joan Krupa, Pat Cudaletta, thank you for your service. Uh, and then you know me, if I get going, I'll introduce every single person in this room because I love you all and I care about you deeply. But let's dive in. I like taking pictures and I want to just share a few pictures to reflect on what happened in this last year. What an extraordinary year it was. First of all, everything we do, and especially from this day forward with the new strategic plan, is about one thing, to create the inspired community. We are not a building. We are not exhibitions. We are not collections of valuable objects. We have those things, but who we are as the Peoria Riverfront Museum are people inspiring each other and being inspired by each other. And that makes us different, folks. Makes us different. Because we don't care so much about whether the object has a value of $26 million at auction at Christie's or not, although we'll take those when they come our way. We care about what we do with that object to inspire the little girl who comes in here from Glen Oak School on an Every Student Initiative trip. That's who we are, that's why we are different and I'm telling you, this museum is in the process and aiming high to transform the engagement of this community to make us the most engaged community in the country. That is our goal. Our goal is not for the museum. Our goal is for this region, this community. Let's take a look back. Come on. The first museum in the world to host the traveling major exhibition from the American Museum of Natural History, T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator, presented by SAFQ, and thanks to all of you, smashing success, went from here to Vancouver, Canada. This summer, from New York City's American Museum of Natural History, and a continuing trend we're not looking to upstate Illinois to bring our major exhibitions in. We're looking to the Big Apple. Why? That is the cultural capital for this sort of thing, the great museums. We're bringing more from New York. This is Creatures of Light, Nature's Bioluminescence. Guess where it was immediately prior to coming to the Peoria Riverfront Museum? New York City, Manhattan. And now it's here. Please go and stick your head up through the... Uh, the cave in New Zealand. We brought out our collections according to our previous strategic plan. We had a collections initiative. We wanted to share. We have 15,000 objects in our collection, each one of them with a story to inspire. This is the Durier right front and center. The most important historic object in Peoria. It tells the story of the Durier brothers who once made bicycles in Trefskers. Had a lot of baked goods there. That was the that was a Durier bicycle factory. And uh, Charles Durier took off and created the first mass-produced automobile, gasoline-powered automobile, in the history of the United States. And we own it. It's here in our museum. If that's not a story that inspires, I don't know what is. Railroaders. Jack Delano's home front photography. Unbelievable World War II era photographs. We're only the second museum to ever show this collection. Um, as you know, one of, the, uh, one of the families featured in this exhibition of Jack Delano's 
incredible photographs was Gary Sinise's family. So I wrote to Gary Sinise, the actor. I got a nice response back. It was his grandfather and his father's a little boy growing up. This little girl here from a Every Student Initiative a glancing into what I consider to be my favorite photo of the entire exhibition, uh, Frank Williams, who just had such an, if you saw this exhibition, you know this black and white photograph shows the determination of America and uh, on the home front during the war. There's Bond French. Bond graduated from Woodruff High School, moved north, little Chicago, little place called Chicago, founded by a guy who farmed here for 10 years before he went to Chicago named DuSable. True story, Chicago was founded by a Peorian, just saying. Bond French has a very successful career in venture capital, chairs the third largest venture capital company in Chicago, and his late father, Taylor French, was the chairman of the board, and his late mother, Joan Trencher French, was the founder of our Docent program, and Bond got involved with us. Not only did he pay to bring this Railroaders exhibition in, but you'll remember three, three and a half years ago, Bond made a $1 million gift here to his hometown to support what we do. Bond is an example of what I call the National Associates, and we're going to launch the National Associates to engage the expatriate Peorians, the alumni of the Peoria area in our community, not only for the museum's sake, but for all of our sake. There is capital out there, charity investment, business investment, and the museum is going to take the lead from here on out to try to engage these people and bring them home. Uh, and Bon French is a terrific human being. We are joined in the house by the extraordinary Preston Jackson. Preston, please stand up. We have to recognize Preston Jackson, a most remarkable figure, has done something for our museum that is even greater than we thought it was going to be. 25 years in the making, Bronzeville to Harlem, hundreds of painted bronze figures, all representing historic figures. Preston has made this a promised gift to the collection of the Peoria Riverfront Museum to inspire the people of our community for ages to come, and it's happening. In the first year, people would come to see T-Rex, Preston. I'd, I'd see him in the hallway leaving. I'd say, what was your favorite thing? They said, that city in there with all the Bronzeville and the Har So we're going to talk a little bit about what's happened right across facing Bronzeville to Harlem, but Preston, thank you for, and he's in the museum all the time telling this story. So, amazing. Art Bridges, we're going to hear a little bit later about Alice Walton's foundation, the wealthiest woman in the United States, Alice Walton, and the most important American art collector in 100 years since Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Alice Walton's foundation has us as one of the top 10 museum dance partners in philanthropy. This painting behind this beautiful family who came in, Every Student Initiative, this painting is by Mark Bradford of Los Angeles, and it, let me just say, this is a painting we could not afford with our acquisitions budget right now. It's an extraordinary painting. People come from uh, all over the country when they would visit here, and they were blown away. The Heinzman brothers know it. Here is one of our families involved with the museum. That's Allison Unkovich and her uh, young models. Uh, who, when they show up all the time, I like to photograph them looking at, this is Terry Atkins' mound of symbols. And then, come on, Ken Burns just announced his 41st documentary on PBS. Do you see that this week? Our friends down the street at WTVP, America's greatest public media station, right just around Water Street. Ken Burns has a private collection of quilts. And I want to tell you a quick story. There's Todd Baker, you just heard from him, our vice chairman, and there's Lori Baker, who this year, more important than Todd Baker to this museum. Sorry, Todd, and you know it. Is Lori, I don't know if Lori was able to make it tonight, but I want to just tell you very quickly that Lori, three years ago, and with Todd, came to see me in my office and said, what if we could get Ken Burns' collection of quilts? I said, Ken Burns? I've met Ken Burns three times. I didn't even know, he, what do you mean? He collects quilts? Lori said... Lori is with the Gems of the Prairie local quilt organization. It's the holy grail of quilt collections. So Bill Conger, Zach Zetterberg, our team went after it. We became the third and final place to show Ken Burns' private collection of quilts in America. And by the way, 
It's home in New Hampshire now, and it ain't going back out. Did I just say ain't at a museum presentation? It was more of a Mark Twain-ish, you know, colloquialism, but. Now here's what's even better. Flo and Sid Banwert, Visionary Society donors to the museum, who paid the freight to bring Ken Burns quilts in, called me and said, we can't find any book that's ever been produced on Ken Burns quilts. Neither can we. He doesn't have one. He said, what if the Peoria Riverfront Museum produced the catalog on Ken Burns quilts, the coffee table book? So Lori Baker just happened to not only be a quilter, she was a nationally known quilt publisher and editor in her career from which she thought she was retired until she volunteered hundreds of hours of her time to edit and produce the book on Ken Burns quilts that'll be made available nationally and it'll be out in September and it is gonna be a beauty, and all of you Visionary Society members will get a copy for free. You can clap for both the book and the free copy that's coming your way. And, and folks, it doesn't matter if we bring Ken Burns quilts in, if this doesn't happen, and this happens. Look at those kids, Valeska Hinton. They made their own quilts. This is something they just did on their own. And they brought the quilts in to, to be with Ken Burns quilts. Now folks, if that, it doesn't make me want to come to work at 3 o'clock in the morning every morning, which I don't come at 3. I might be up at 3, but it does. It's amazing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, identical twins celebrated the 39th birthday anniversary this year. Do you mind me saying what it was? 65 years. And what did these two do? Everybody around town's known the Heinzman brothers. They're, they're great patron, supporters, enthusiasts of art, art making. One's an artist, the other's an accountant. One wears black and white only, the other wears color. It's an incredible story, but how they celebrate their 65th birthday? By coming to Bill Conger, our chief curator, and telling them, unbeknownst to us and barely anybody, that they had the most important collection of modern art in the history of Peoria, and they're giving it to the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Stand up, you two, please. Let's hear it for Jeff and John Heinzman. Now, we'll hear a little more about the details of that collection, but I will mention they are also champion swimmers from Peoria High. Wait a minute. Did anybody know that uh, we're kind of into decoys here? So I got to tell you, I think the board, nobody on the board is a decoy collector or a duck hunter, to the best of my knowledge. But everybody on the board and everybody on the staff agrees. This is one thing we can do better than anybody else in the whole country. We are at the epicenter of the Midwest Mississippi Flyway, and these decoys are the best of the best in the world. And last week, in a conservation group known as Ducks Unlimited has conserved millions of acres of land for the habitat of Waterfowl Flyway had the national premiere of Wings Over Water, a new IMAX film narrated by Batman, I mean Michael Keaton. <laughs> True story, we had him here from around the country and it's showing three times a day, so come see it. What the Center for American Decoys is doing is giving us some partnerships that are, go way outside of Illinois. This is a national thing that is emerging. So this is a bird that a donor just paid last month one hundred thousand dollars at auction for it is anonymously lent but it is on the floor of our museum right now these are major major works of american folk art made by people without any formal schooling self-taught and they're about as american as it gets self-reliance the indigenous peoples of america invented the technology it's where it came from and as preston jackson is fond of, of, of posting occasionally on his facebook page thank you he loves the, don't you love the decoys? So, somehow they just came back to me, the decoy. Mark Elliott's Art of Film. Mark Elliott, New York-based author, best-selling author, incredible. Every Friday and Sunday, Mark Elliott's Art of Film, you'll see some of the most spectacular films that haven't been seen possibly ever on a screen like this, because as you may know, this is the 
Now, the largest movie screen in the state of Illinois is right in front of us. I felt really bad when IMAX Navy Pier permanently closed. Sent them a sympathy letter, and then we declared we are number one. We are number one. And speaking of number one, our planetarium has had in the last year and a couple of months a major upgrade. Uh, upgrade. Six incredible Sony projectors, 10.5K resolution. A private philanthropy went in. Some grant money. We hardly ever get government grant money, but they had a special grant for this kind of thing. Has upgraded our system, and thousands of school children went in and saw at the most incredible 6.5K resolution, 10 um, 10 times the brightness of our former, our previous system. And we just added, for you Pink Floyd fans, a brand new laser light system that is, according to the guy who came and installed it uh, from the West, uh, Renee said, John, he did say it was the best. And I said, well, I, then I'm going to tell everybody from now on. So, <laughs> look, in the midst of our own issues, we looked across the sea and we looked in our own backyard to our Lebanese American population. And for the first time, the museum reached out and did something really of service to the fine art of Lebanon, Lebanese culture. We worked with Dr. Michelle Corey and a number of local folks. We brought in a, a couple, what was it, 125 different works of art from the leading artist of Beirut, Lebanon the leading contemporary artist. We auctioned them off and every penny went to support the relief of what happened on August 4th, 2020 with that terrible explosion, one of the worst uh, explosions in, in history outside of wartime. And Dr. Tony Karam made it all happen and came in and played the new nine foot concert grand Steinway for the first time was played by one of the greatest child prodigy pianists in, in the Middle East and a good personal friend of mine from my time in Washington, D.C. as a student, Dr. Tony Karam. Anybody at that concert, by the way, a few of you in the room, it was, uh, it was something to behold. This is Dr. Todd Ward, Ag Lab. We do little exhibitions, this one on penicillin. The mass production of penicillin that saved millions of lives from our community our curators put together one of many little hallway cases. Check out those hallway cases. They're always good. I put Todd in here because how proud he is that we're celebrating the Ag Lab's achievement uh, on that. And he's one of 240, 240 partners in this community that the museum has with different programs. 240. Here's another one. Bradley University Interactive Media Department. This is their students celebrating their own projects at the end of their semester just about a month ago from the Interactive Media Department, filling up the lobby and surrounding that 120-year-old hand-carved horse that the, that the Midwest Agriculture Museum conveyed to us as they went out of business and gave us their money to establish a permanent endowment fund and 25 of their best objects from agriculture surrounded by interactive media gamer types from Bradley. It only happens at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. It's incredible. And it only happens because of the purple wall. I don't have to tell you, you walk by it, you feel the power. It just attracts you as you walk through the downstairs hallway. <laughs> Pulls you in because that's the power of philanthropy. Private philanthropy. It's unbelievable. You heard Kara Jensen say earlier, 80% of our funding is support funding, not earned revenue. We're able to, to fight way, way above the weight class, as Brian said. Let's talk about what's about to happen. July 4th weekend, in the biggest collaboration yet with Art Bridges, Alice Walton's foundation in Bentonville, Arkansas, we are, we are bringing American revolutionaries, art and disruption, and it has the most important paintings and sculpture we've ever shown in Peoria. And it's opening on July 4th weekend. And the uh, revolutionaries uh, are, it's a sort of a double entendre. It's not just about a revolutionary period. It's the revolutionaries. We're going to hear from Bill Conger and Bill Heydrich in a minute more about it. And don't be scared. I've got an announcement to make. The most popular science exhibition in the history of museums, Body Worlds, 
is coming to the Peoria Riverfront Museum next summer for six months. This will draw people from all over the region. It's an incredible exhibition, and we're going to pair it with our own self-curated exhibition. We'll be working with all the medical institutions in the area, Jump and others, we've already started, to bring an exhibition on the heart. Children's Interactive's a little friendlier for the little ones. Body Worlds is a German physician who figured out a way to plasticize scientifically donated bodies and to educate us on everything from the nervous system to the muscular system. And it is, it is a fascinating thing to see. I've seen it, but it will be here for the first time and is kind of a big reveal today for you all because you took the time to come to the State of the Museum Address. How about that, Body Worlds? So with that, I want to introduce one other person who has been such a phenomenal partner to us at the museum, the, really the Renaissance man himself, an artist, a historian, um, and somebody who's just a great donor and friend to the museum, and he sits on my president's advisory council here, and I just want to give a shout out to Lonnie Stewart. Lonnie is in the house. Lonnie, please stand up and let, let us acknowledge you. One of the great artists and creative forces. So with that, what I would like to do is take a minute to bring forward four people who I admire greatly and I work with every day. The first is Bill Conger, our chief curator of the museum. The second, the single most important advisor that I've had in five years at the museum, our guest curator, who splits his time between Manhattan, Palm Beach, Michigan, and Peoria. Four good places to be, but Peoria, I hope, is his favorite. Bill Heydrich, our guest curator. I also want to bring down our Director of Education and Engagement, Barb Dawson, and her colleague and the head of our Every Student Initiative, Everly Davis. Come on down, and I want to have a conversation with you all. So, <laughs> worth an applause. So we're going to hear a little bit more about some specific details, and, and then following that, we're going to conclude by a couple of big special announcements. So hold on. There's a lot coming. So Bill Conger, five years coming up in the fall at the museum. Bill Heydrich has his Keith Haring shirt on, celebrating the Heinzman's incredible gift to the museum. Barb Dawson and Everly Davis. Bill, turn it over to you and Bill. Thank you, John. Uh, this October uh, marks my fifth year uh, overseeing collections and exhibitions at this great museum. And I remember my first meeting that I had uh, as um, a new museum uh, staff member was with the two gentlemen on either side of me. And uh, there was one dictate that was uh, not so softly put to me, which was collections, collections. We have over 15,000 objects in a long and nearly 60 year history of collecting. And I thought we'd bring Bill today um, to kind of reconvene a little bit about collections of the past, a little bit about that history of our collections, but mainly uh, to show us <laughs> what the last year has been, and I hope at the end of this you will agree with me that our, the state of the collections at Peoria Riverfront Museum is strong. Uh, if we could advance, please. I'd like to start with the upper left uh, image there, Bill. Uh, we received, not very long ago, a, um, a, a grouping of about 11 works from uh, Claudie Huey, uh, by way of Barbara Glick, that uh, used to belong to Merle Glick, was collected originally by Merle. And these were bestowed upon the museum. We accessioned them into the collection, uh, actually, uh, at our last meeting. And uh, along with the works of decoys that, that Merle was so fond of, uh, also came some paintings by Louis Lucier and, and other uh, uh, folk artists. So I know you knew Merle 
and had a little history with Mer Merle, and, and uh, he had some important thoughts about the collection, so I... Sure. Uh, am I on? Oops. I could speak loudly, but... Oh. Am I on now? You're on. Thank You're you. On. Um, I think in, in a moment we're going to talk about the Heinzman gift, but I think clearly one of the most important aspects of the history of this museum, the collections at this museum, is the role of truly inspired, in selfless individuals. And outstanding in that category, in part because of historical reasons, is Merle Glick, um, an individual from our community, Pekin. Uh, he worked at Caterpillar, but his real passion was American folk art, particularly Illinois folk art. Now, having said that, I also discovered once we were talking about the museum acquiring a Grant Wood print, he just offered that at one point he had owned every single one of Grant Wood's prints, but had decided to sell them to buy something else. I am quite pleased that uh, gifts uh, from the Glick family continue to come to the museum. Uh, their situation, I suspect, is one like many collectors. They can't just give everything they have at once. Um, it takes time, and it's, it's been very important. And when this museum was built, a commitment was made to Merle Glick to show parts of his collection on an ongoing basis. And so part of the reason why I was sitting on one side of you, Bill Conger, and John Morris was on the other, was to, uh, let's just say, advance that idea and to honor some of those commitments which had been made. Otherwise, it was time to change direction. Glad we didn't. <laughs> we, we, we definitely did not. Um, Along with some of the exhibitions we put together, certainly the Center for American Decoys, which continues to foster that great art form uh, that, that Merle was so committed to. Uh, just in the past year, year and a half, we hosted an exhibition of 101 uh, treasures from the permanent collection uh, in which we got out our favorites, but also what I believe to be the most important works that we had acquired over this long history. And that's vital to what the museum does. It gives uh, a structure to the activities. It gives a resource for you all to draw on as we look at all of these initiatives, these creative initiatives, which are so exciting with the public schools and the private schools bringing all these kids here. You and succeeding generations will have fabulous materials to draw on. And I, I just have to say, sort of to explain my shirt that I have on, if you can see it. <laughs> uh, I bought this shirt 35 years ago at a place called The Pop Shop in New York City when the artist who designed it, Keith Herring, uh, was not particularly well known. And one of the, the great gifts uh, that will be included in the Heitzman uh, donation is, is a really wonderful Keith Herring. Uh, I wish I'd bought the painting rather than the shirt, but <laughs> I still have it. And I think... For me, it was a wonderful surprise to hear about that collection coming here. And I have to believe that some of what informed their decision was the museum's commitment to collections and the work that you and John have been doing uh, these last five years. Uh, certainly, we, we look back to Merle Glick and people like that for having done so much for this institution, but it's the continuing, it's the ongoing effort, and it's something that, that needs, it's a, it's a energy, commitment that needs to be renewed all the time. And you have, and that's outstanding. And I hope everybody's seen that collection, because I, I think certainly for, for ongoing generations, it provides this institution with a framework for discussing contemporary art that it has never had before. It's been more of sort of hocus pocus photographs and hope you can borrow something from somebody. Well, now you've got some real works of art that'll be here all the time for everybody to enjoy and learn from. It's a marvelous gift, guys. Really excited. When they invited me to their apartment, uh, they very humbly said, we have a few things over the years that we've, we've been collecting. We really have the museum in mind. If you, if you choose not to, that's fine. And uh, boy, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I walked in there and from floor to ceiling, uh, some of the greatest uh, artists in, in modern and contemporary art, from Agnes Martin to Keith Haring, of course, you're wearing a Keith Haring shirt, uh, Joel Shapiro and um, 
uh, Max Ernst. It goes on and on, and the, the exhibition as you see it only constitutes about, what, a quarter of the work, guys? There is a lot more to experience. Well, and here we are, Bill. We're looking at them, and seated next to them is Kay Cook, who is so wonderfully stepped forward to support a major acquisition at this institution, the Ron Bladen sculpture, which Absolutely. you found. You contacted the estate. You got those pieces uh, here as a loan to flesh out uh, a context for the great piece we have, in which we've all been enjoying, thanks to the Junior League of Peoria in front of the Civic Center, but now we are more directly linked to that great piece, and we can provide a much larger context, much more exciting context for looking at contemporary sculpture here in Peoria, Illinois. And you know, Kay, that's just such a wonderful gift, and thank you, you know, from everyone for for seeing uh, how important this is and, and stepping up to make it possible. Incredible, exactly right. Some of the other images here, uh, we recently received this beautiful glasswork by Lino Talia Pietra, uh, a contemporary of, of Dale Chihuly, one of the most important glass artists walking the planet, uh, by David Gregory, who was uh, for us for a time a docent and a very good friend of the museum and came forward with this and we were uh, so thrilled. It is on display if you go through Creatures of Light, after you exit, you will see that work. And I do not want to forget um, this amazing installation of records that you probably saw when you came in here. It's been up for about six months. And a couple years ago, I made the acquaintance of Mary Ann and Jerry Milam, who owned Golden Voice Recording Company in South Pekin in the 1960s and 70s and recorded hundreds of acts and some of the most amazing uh, rock acts and gospel acts that you can imagine, Ario Speedwagon, Sticks, of course, Dan Fogelberg, um, people like Steve Gibson, who went on to become the first director of the Grand Old Opry uh, and played on over 14,000 uh, recordings. Uh, and I think over 3,000 of those were number one hits, a Peorian. They have gifted us their entire collection, and what you see out there is a beginning. They are continually adding to, uh, to our uh, stock by framing and, and making the first presses of every one of those records available to us. Soon you'll be able to push a button on your phone or a device and hear them. Uh, that is coming as well. So another amazing gift, all within the past year, at Peoria Riverfront Museum. And uh, these are some of the highlights, but there are so many others that, that we received there are, this year. But also, as, as we reflect on how wonderful these things are and how meaningful it is, uh, some really exciting stuff's been going on with those people from Bentonville, Arkansas. And in fact, I think you had dinner with her, Bill. <laughs> I, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, boy, you put me on the spot. I will have to admit to it. Yes, I, I did make a visit to Bentonville, Arkansas, where Crystal Bridges and, and its foundation, Art Bridges, who has been bringing us uh, numerous projects now. Uh, we are moving into our fifth, fifth project with Alice Walton of the, of the uh, Walmart industry fame. Her father, of course, Sam Walton, who who uh, began Walmart. I was at a convening with about 30 other museums at a dinner, and I was looking for my, my name tent. And I kept moving to the center of the room, and I found it, and it was right next to Alice. And the folks from Art Bridges uh, were kind of hanging around to watch my reaction because they'd planned the whole thing and strategically put us right next to her, and it was the most charming dinner uh, with the most amazing person, uh, and we have got to get her to Peoria. We do, and I think one of the greatest things further about Art Bridges is not only did they write checks to museums that they supported, that they liked during COVID, but the quality of the works of art that have come to Peoria, and 
I'm not belittling this, but without much fuss, if you wanted to go, and I'm not going to look down at the Art Institute of Chicago, <laughs> but if you went to go knock on their door and try to borrow these things, maybe in five years they maybe. might get back to you. Maybe. Uh, this, is, this is happening. Uh, they're facilitating these extraordinary loans, which we wouldn't see at a very quick clip, uh, I would add, as you, if you've intimated. Uh, the addition of the Archibald Motley across from Preston Jackson's masterpiece, uh, Bronzeville to Harlem, um, was strategic, of course. We celebrated Bronzeville to Harlem last year, and as we did that, I was already talking to Art Bridges, who said, let's make this happen. Let's get the Archibald Motley Chicago painter from the 30s and 40s uh, who celebrated Bronzeville. This painting uh, that Preston is photographed near is, is called Bronzeville at Night. And it is such an amazing kind of bit of closure to the sculptural experience that you get when you, when you walk into uh, Bronzeville to Harlem. And I just have to add for all of us, who are that crowd that goes to, sort of grew up go, going to museums, it's really quite unusual and astonishing to have some of these things come together. And the other day, John and I were in the galleries, and we ran into a woman who was almost dizzy with excitement. And John, of course, oh, hi, how, I'm John Morris, I'm the director of the museum. Can't and, imagine. And she's a uh, PhD MD researcher from uh, Rushville. Well, she's from Bronzeville. Yeah. But she, she lives was, in Bronzeville. Yeah, yeah. and she was uh, here by accident. It's incredible. And Preston. absolutely blown away by the experience. Yeah. And Phenomenal. she's from Chicago, and she's going to go back and tell everybody how wonderful Peoria, Illinois is. And this is something that was not forced. It wasn't contrived. It just happened. All right, Bill and Bill, so much to say on this, but in the interest of time, one last thing to say on Art Bridges, and then we're going to hear from Barb and Evelyn. American Revolutionaries, Art and Disruption, a dozen pieces from, from Alice and Gang, and a number of pieces from our own collection and local lenders uh, that will uh, be very exciting for the public to see. Uh, and it celebrates this amazing uh, relationship that artists have to art, which is continually prompting, pushing uh, this kind of um, soft revolt against uh, their predecessors, and uh, that's how art moves and changes. And lastly, of course, John, Endangered Species by Andy Warhol coming in September. Amazing. The entire Endangered Species a series by Andy Warhol, Alice Walton's private uh, uh, collected works coming to Peoria for the first time anywhere since she acquired them. How about that? So... Now, thank you to Bill, and it's always thanks to Bill Heydrich, who is among our, our best donors, our best advisors, and just, uh, we, we have done this with him. We would not know of Art Bridges without him. He's the one that brought this relationship to us. So Bill Heydrich, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we're gonna move to Barb and Everly, and I wanna intro introduce them. They're a dynamic team. They have just pulled off getting all these students back on track to come in, because we were, we had some challenges, uh, something, this, something about a pandemic, and it shut everybody down. The, not only are they getting the students back in, but Alice Walton's Foundation Art Bridges is making grant after grant, not only to get the art here, but to give the education team uh, opportunities to do things. So Barb, Everly, let's hear what you're up to. Thank you, John. Um, I'm coming up on my third year here at the museum, and as John mentioned, um, Six months into my run here, we hit the pandemic. And I learned some things. We all learned things during that. For me, uh, I learned that we definitely miss the field trips. We miss the students here in the museum. Uh, two, people really miss their interactive, hands-on activities here at the museum. And third, as we all know, we really missed being together with each other. We missed gathering and spending time. With that, the first thing I did was hire myself the best educator I could find, and the two of us got busy engaging. So let, we're gonna share with you a little bit what we've been up to the last year. I think there may be some pictures that we can start to roll. 
All right, I'm going to let Everly talk a little bit about this one. All right, so earlier it was said that, um, you know, through the outpouring of the generous philanthropic efforts of the Visionary Society, um, we were able to grow the ESI program this year, and now we offer this field trip opportunity to 12,000 students across six districts and 36 schools. Um, which is amazing, and we are going to continue to grow um, in the coming school year as well. And on this field trip, they get to visit all the facets of the museum. So they get to come into the largest screen theater um, that we're sitting in to view an educational film. They get to go to the planetarium and see that new updated system. And then they get to go through the galleries and view the exhibitions that we have on display through the lens of an ESI guide, which is something that we added this year to help bridge the content of the classroom with our informal learning space here in the museum. And along with that, we've also given them activities that follow our PIA model, um, where students are able to do these activities and have independence in exploring the museum, but also gives them an opportunity to achieve something while they're here. And so we've had positive responses from both students and teachers um, for our new model, and we only hope to continue to improve it and grow it. Thank you, Everly. Let me go to the next photo. Okay, so this photo is an example of something, when I say we started to create spaces, um, one of the first things we defined coming back from the pandemic was the Dino Lab. And this was a space, a maker space, dedicated to kids to go in and extended what was in the gallery and gave them hands-on activities. It was a success, and we now currently have some pictures here showing what we have up for the Luminescence Lab. We've used the same space, but created activities in there. You can see some of our um, fun guests here in front of the light bright. The giant light bright seems to be a hint, a uh, hit. Um, we have daily activities that can go on and, and hands-on activities. When those activities aren't going on, the space is open for everybody to go in and experience certain things within that space. Um, so this is one of the defined spaces that we're now going to be doing with every new exhibition here at the, gal at the museum, and this is the lab. These are a little more pictures. The picture um, uh, with the screen on the wall is showing some new software that we have here at the museum called Draw Alive. And this brings great inspiration and confidence to all that try. Um, you can, we give you a template that has a fish or something on it that's colored. You scan the object, it uploads, and the the, the picture that the, has been drawn actually comes to life and starts swimming in the tank with the other animals. It's very cool to watch. The kids um, have such a blast seeing their creation come to life on the screen. So um, we will continue to do things like this to extend what's in the galleries. Here is another space um, that we defined um, during um, the past year, and this was for OpArt, and we are calling these spaces in the gallery the gathering galleries, uh, a place where people can go and congregate and stay and talk and really um, just be with each other and extending the experience that they've seen of the works of art or, um, you know, what's in the gallery, that experience gets extended. A, lar a large part of that is um, furniture that we've been um, uh, purchasing that extends the experience and the furniture in and of themselves um, are a work of art. Uh, many of them then have um, become part of our, um, you know, our um, experience. So thank you. Another space that we defined, um, and this is the studio, and this is a space that's going to be all technology. It's a 3D virtual reality lab. Um, and we hope to get this, uh, we are right now test piling it. It will be going live soon, as soon as we define more programming. But this will be another way to extend the experience for those visitors that come to the museum. Yeah, and a gift of uh, former educator Jody Pine, retired now, and her husband Greg, a very generous gift to the museum. Be opening soon. 
really speak to this Yeah, point. and here you can see um, how we engage the students in the gallery. So what they're crowding around um, is actually our state fossil, the Tully Monster. Um, and in the background, you can see not only their teacher, but one of our ESI guides um, explaining to them. And what we see from groups that don't have the ESI guide that can translate the story of these objects is kids may breeze through the gallery and not know what they're looking at. But we bring those objects to life by telling their stories and talking to students in a way that engages them and then they get excited about these objects. So to a kid that's, you know, it's not explained, it's kind of like, why is there a rock in a glass case? Um, <laughs> but our ESI guides then tell you the story of these, these creatures and why we have this fossil. Um, and as you can see, they're enamored and just their eyes are wondering and curious. And then we get these conversations happening in the galleries, which we love so much. Great. Great, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks to all of my colleagues. Thank you. So, two big things left to do. First, Bill Heydrich did a little intro earlier, but now I'm gonna get to a big announcement that he already made. Kay Cook, would you come forward, please? Kay Cook is an incredible supporter of this museum. She spent a career with Eli Lilly, Indianapolis. She was with the Indianapolis Museum of Art, now known as Newfields. She was the chair of the collections committee at Newfields, a major art collector herself, and she retired, moving back here to Tremont. Kay Cook, last year, end of the year, made an extraordinary $100,000 gift to start the K. Cook Art Fund to help us to bring and acquire great art. And it is a real exciting privilege for the board and Bill Heydrich and I to announce that this that you see up there, Cosmic Seed by artist Ronald Bladen, the late Ronald Bladen, the same minimalist artist who was commissioned and built for us the most famous modern sculpture in Peoria, the Sonar Tide, this now is the Peoria Riverfront Museum's Cosmic Seed, thanks to Kay Cook. Now, this is amazing because when Bill got this on loan, Kay paid to put the concrete down. It was a simple thing. She said, you know, sculpture needs concrete. It was just on loan. We never imagined that we'd be able to acquire it. But through the work that we've done with the Ronald Bladen Estate, there's Josh Schwank, who's out of town today, chair of our collections committee, the incomparable Sally Snyder, trustee emerita, and, and uh, the pioneering founder of our Every Student Initiative, Kay and Bill Conger. When we just got it on loan, we had a little ceremony to celebrate that concrete. Lo and behold, we took this picture today on the hot day. We own Cosmic Seed by Ronald Bladen, and may it be an uplifting, optimistic piece for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, Kay Cook. So I would imagine many of you don't know much about me, so I will give my little biography. I grew up in Tremont, Illinois, and I went to the University of Illinois, and then I left Illinois swearing I would never move back to the Midwest. So I spent a few years in California, a few more years near Boston, and then I got a job with Eli Lilly in Indianapolis. <laughs> so I work, I arrived there in 1966. 50 years later, I decided, you know, it's really time to go back to my hometown. <laughs> so here I am. Then every cloud has a, maybe a little silver lining. The Internal Revenue service in its wisdom decided during this pandemic we really need to encourage people to be philanthropic so they increased the amount of donations you could reduce uh, related to your adjusted gross income so I was able to take out both money from my R IRA my 401k actually at Lilly and my husband's and not get hit with a big tax bill. So that's where the $100,000 came from. <laughs> Don't expect that every year. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm glad to be 
here in uh, Tremont and Peoria and, and trying to get more integrated into the community here in Peoria and um, look forward to several more years of enjoying the museum and other organizations in the area. Thank you, Jake. Thank you very much. And Steve Jackson, our board chair, Anne Marie has has a uh, little something we've grown here in the museum gardens. And <laughs> thank you. One more, one more round of applause. Kay Cook. Thank you, Kay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, the final act of the evening uh, is really a, a, a special one. Um, James Smithson uh, was a Brit who, uh, who thought it was pretty cool what these revolutionaries did over here to found a new country. He never actually visited the country, but upon his death, he left his estate for the purposes of an educational institution, and he left his money to the United States Congress, which, Kay, we don't want you to do, <laughs> and nobody else. But the Congress took the resources and created with it the Smithsonian Institution, named for James Smithson. Today, we are, remain one of the earliest affiliated museums with the Smithsonian Institution. And so five years ago, when I came to this uh, museum, uh, it, an idea came my way to create the James Smithson Leadership Award, because the Smithsonian actually is very much a parallel to what we are, a multidisciplinary place two of us both nationally important institutions. <laughs> and so the James Smithson Leadership Award has been given out now for the last five years. I'd like the previous recipients of the James Smithson Award, the Leadership Award, to please come forward. Uh, Sid Ruckriegel, Sally Snyder, uh, Randy Root was unable, I think, to be here, uh, but Bernie and Barb Drake as well. If you'd please come forward. Uh, so we can acknowledge, again, these are phenomenal leaders. Sid served for uh, years and three terms as chair of the board. Sally, the founding, uh, the founding personality of every student initiative and a founding board member, now tr our first ever trustee, Emerita Barb Drake, who wrote 147 editorials, literally, <laughs> at the Journal Star over 30 years about trying to have a museum in Peoria, and Bernie Drake, one of the great history buffs and enthusiasts, um, that we have in our community. It gives me really great pride, and there's so many great people in this room, but in front of all of these great people, to acknowledge as we approach the 10th anniversary of this incredible, unique, multidisciplinary museum, to announce this year's recipient of the James Smithson Leadership Award, Andrew Rand. <laughs> Andrew, please come forward. Now, Andrew Rand is, is an extraordinary human being. Talk about multidisciplinary human being. Andrew Rand is the CEO of Advanced Medical Transport, AMT. Andrew Rand is the chairman on his final lap, the chairman of the Peoria County Board. Andrew Rand oversaw the construction committee of this great institution, literally every brick. He knew what was going on. Andrew Rand is a Clemson man. Andrew Rand is, is, a, is the, a poster child for what it means to be a museum person. And I took this picture of Andrew when he and I were sitting on stage at the installation ceremony of 700 new citizens to the United States. And I will tell you, Andrew, that James... Shadid Judge is bringing that ceremony to the Peoria Riverfront Museum on the 10th anniversary this year. A couple of other images of Andrew. This is taken a year ago. No, actually 10, I think, Andrew. <laughs> this is Andrew and Sid on the, on the opening of the Peoria Riverfront Museum when Andrew had overseen construction uh, on behalf of the county board. This is Andrew and Sally Snyder, who's up here with us on the day of the solar eclipse. This is Andrew doing his civic duty, chairing the county board and watching out for the taxpayers of Peoria and receiving my annual report, which I make to the county board. It gives me just tremendous pleasure to introduce 
the man of the hour, the James Smithson Leadership Award recipient, Andrew Rand. Thank you, John. Uh, big surprise. Thank you, everyone who uh, support this wonderful community treasure and continue to support this wonderful community treasure. I think a museum is a community, and a community is a museum. Certainly my history with John goes back more than just the number of years uh, the Peoria Riverfront Museum has been on my plate to take, help take care of. Uh, but you, as you know, you have one of the most inspirational leaders in the whole world here. So thank you, John, for leading this effort and for all that you do to make this thing work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. God bless you. And for all of us who are friends and family members, uh, and, uh, and I'll tell you, a surprise guest, who has the same last name as me, who served on the county board with you as your co-chair of construction, is in the house, Stephen Morris. And, uh, and so I know firsthand how much work was gone on. I want to conclude by doing something that nobody expects, but I want each of the previous recipients to say one cool thing about Andrew Rand and why we all love him so much. We'll start with Barb Drake. Did you say cool thing or, cr or cruel thing? <laughs> It's a free country. <laughs> well, one cool thing about him is it just all that he's done for the community I love. Thank you. Thank you. That's cool. Lives in a neat house also. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew Rand came here 20, 31 years ago. I was lucky enough to be chair of the board that got him here as a 29-year-old. Um, you can all do the math, um, and um, he has been absolutely marvelous for this community and a great, great friend. We are so lucky to have him and all he has done. My best hire ever. And I, I had some others that weren't so good, but he was phenomenal. One of the things that I uh, believe was on, one of the first things that he was charged with on the county board was given the responsibility of helping make for sure that this museum got built. And it was a referendum that passed through the community. And he knew at that time that there was a charge from the community that this effort needed to happen, but it needed to happen in such a way that would actually bind the community together. And he was down here on each and every day of construction. And I think um, he was actually here the day that they put the screen through the side because you couldn't get it in any other way. But at one of those times, I remember him saying, that because I, I made a comment about, isn't it great that you're building this museum, that, that you're leading this thing? And he's like, no. He goes, I have a little bit of time to make for sure this happens. It'll be the community around us and the city around us and the people that take charge from the point we open that'll make it what it is. And I think today, with what we've seen on the screen from our speakers, the interaction that we're seeing within our community, that that dream has actually been fulfilled and what an amazing 10 years it's been. Andrew, thank you for your leadership on this. John, to all the board members, all the community, um, thank you for making Andrew's dream and vision for this museum come true as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Steve Jackson, join me out here on, on behalf of the board, our chairman, Steve Jackson. What a leader we have in Steve Jackson to keep this place going. Andrew, God bless. Congratulations to you. And thank you, everyone. The best is yet to come for the inspired community in this entire nation. God bless.